Hello, Brett. Hi, Steve. Uh, <laughs> good to see you, man. Yeah, it's real good to see you as well. You're one of my all-time favorite writers, so I've been I've had you on my list to come on my show for a long time. So I'm glad that we finally made this happen. Well, you're one of my all-time favorite movers and shakers in Boston. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, now, I was reading a little about you, and I don't know for sure, but you're from Western Mass, right? Not originally. No, I'm from upstate New York. Um, oh. I was born in Austin. Uh, grew up uh, kind of in uh, Wappingers Falls, which is outside of Poughkeepsie. It's a big, uh, it's a big bedroom community for New York now, but it was just a little boring kind of hamlet when I lived there. Um, and Western Mass is where I went to college. I went to Hampshire, which is out in Amherst, and moved here right after graduation. So I'm not a native Massachusetts person. And you got your master's in journalism at BU. I got that part right. I did. Right? I did. Yeah. Um, and, and didn't the one thing I learned is how to write, like the actual reporting stuff. I don't think I learned a lot. Uh, but they, I did have a, a professor that was very good on the whole idea of writing a snappy lead and all that kind of thing. So that that became something that stayed with me. That's cool. Now, when you were in college, is that when you first started getting involved in the Boston music scene and going to see bands? Like around what time was that? That would have been, I was in college between 76 and 80. Um, wow. And wow. yeah, um, I'm, I am I am 64. And we you had, don't look um, it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, because Amherst was right outside Boston, we did have a lot of people coming to play like the night before or after they played in Boston. So I think um, I know I saw the I think the first Boston rock act I ever saw was Willie Alexander, which is a great place to start. Yeah, um, because there was a, a real pivotal show for me. It was fall of 1977. <coughs> the Ramones played the Blue Wall at UMass and Willie was the opening act. And wow. then um, toward the end of around the time I graduated, there was a big influx of Boston bands playing. Uh, the Fools played in Boston and in Amherst a lot. Robin Lane played Amherst quite a bit with the Chartbusters. And at the same time, um, my thing was really doing college radio. I had a, a show on Sunday afternoon that that was the the peak of my day, probably the peak of my life so far. Um, but we got indie records from everywhere, including the Live at the Rat album, which uh, and the original Prettiest Girl single by the Neighborhoods, and they saved Hitler's Brain by Unnatural Acts. So I do remember all those records kind of coming into the fore. What a fantastic time that was! And we're sure going to talk. Was, yeah. We're going to talk about the Mass Ave compilation in a minute yeah. because it's one of my all-time favorite compilations ever. You wrote for like multiple publications over the years. What was the first writing job that you got when you uh, did it? Was it while you were still at BU or or did no? You know, it was it even it was while I was at Amherst. The first person that ever paid me to write was uh, still a friend, a guy named David Sokol was the editor of the Valley Advocate, the arts editor, which is, uh, I think, I believe it's still going. It's kind of the equivalent to the Phoenix out in Western Mass, the, the Valley Advocate. And um, I got to review the, refer the Ramones album, End of the Century, and got paid 25 bucks for that, plus the record for free. So I think it doesn't get any better than that, right? So uh, <laughs> and in fact, it never did get better. Than that. No, but uh, but that was that was the first thing I I um, actually got paid to write about. And when I came to Boston, I guess I had enough of um, confidence at that time to call everybody. Um, I got into Boston Rock Magazine uh, via Greg Reedman, who was editing it at the time. Um, he used me a lot. And I uh, got into the Globe by Steve Morse because I pestered him quite a bit. And he uh, started letting me write record reviews because at that time, um, there, was, there was so much, this is, there was so much more space in local media for arts and music of every kind of arts coverage, you know, compared to there is what there is now, there was five or six times more easily. Um, and every concert in the world was being reviewed. So I reviewed records for about a year, just in that little calendar section that was a weekly thing. And then one night there was a show that needed to be covered and nobody else was available. So I, I got 
I was probably the fifth or sixth person online to get asked to do it, but I did it. And from then on, I was, I was able to do more. Do you remember what show that was? Oh yeah, it vividly, Supertramp uh, at the Whisker Super Centrum. And I had to, uh, and it was the first tour. Uh, no, it was the last tour with Roger Hodgson in the band. So they, uh, they, uh, but um, yeah. And I remember like staying up literally all night, just writing multiple drafts of this review. So, uh, so it was pretty impressed on my brain. Yeah, that whole, uh, so the, the, the era that you started in, I mean, things are obviously never going to be that good again. I mean, we went through yeah, like a, never. <laughs> you know, and, and you know I, know, I know that you got involved later on with Rhino Records and you ended up, um, besides the Mass Ave compilation, you, if I'm not mistaken, you did liner notes for the Cars box set also? Yeah, yeah. Um... Rhino was a real nice place to work at that time. Um, and there, the, at that time, the guy that was the music honcho at Rhino, who is sadly no longer with us, a guy named Gary Stewart, yeah. who's a huge music fan and, you know, lived and breathed it and was basically the guy responsible for everything cool you can name that ever came out on Rhino, um, was pretty friendly toward getting people involved that really, really wanted to be involved. And I was one of those. I was, I was there as a publicist. I was doing publicity. But I said, you know, hey, I'm a writer. I just killed to do some liner notes and something. So he um, used me on the occasional project to do liner notes, um, uh, stuff that they knew I was really into. Like I did two or three that involved Todd Rundgren. Um, Todd, and yeah got to actually compile a, a, a CD of Todd Rundgren Productions, uh, which came out under the title on LP's worth of production. So I got to do that. And I was pretty, at that point, when I left Boston, which was 1990, it was really still peak seeing era. And everyone knew I was pretty homesick for Boston. And they were doing this DIY series, which had a lot of, um, a lot of great, great volumes in it. You know, if, if you know this series, there were pop compilations and punk and, and a couple local, there was, a, there was a New York one, there was an LA one, and they, they let me do a Boston one, um, which was just kind of, it was basically something Gary decided to do. You know, he figured they could sell, it would sell okay, and he figured it would be a really nice thing to let me do it, I guess. So, uh, so I did it, and that became my, my great, great labor of love project. I had the honor of meeting Gary Stewart on many occasions. And I was really yeah. upset when I heard about his passing. He's a really cool guy and really loved music. You know, being in the music business for a long time, like I was, not everyone was always a big music fan. Very Gary true. was a big music fan. And, and everybody you know, that was music fans, you know, liked each other because it was a pretty secret society. Right. So the, the, the Mass Ave compilation, I have a copy of it in my hand here. Yeah. It's one of the greatest compilations ever. When I, re I remember when I first moved to L.A. at the end of 83 and I started working for Enigma Records, people didn't really, really like Boston bands there. They thought Boston was like an inside joke. Like no one really cared about the liars and the real kids and the neighbor. I ended up getting the neighborhoods and the outlets signed to Enigma. But believe me, I had to pull a lot of teeth. How yeah. in the world did you get Gary to let you do this compilation? Was it because it was after the, because it was in the nineties at this time. Yeah. Did they finally gain an appreciation, you think? Well, I think I think Gary was probably a bit sharper than those people at Enigma that didn't that didn't think much of the Boston bands. I mean, you know, Gary uh, Gary certainly knew about uh, you know so, some some of the obvious ones, Mission of Burma, the neighborhoods, the liars. I mean, and the real kids. I mean, I think those at least you can you can say are we're our world-class bands even if nobody's going to you know accept the rest of it you know those bands yeah um and at, at that time there was a pretty good um you know there was there was a pretty good boston presence beginning to happen i mean the pixies were certainly happening by then mm -hmm. and uh lemonhead, lemonhead's not yeah lemonhead's not yet i mean there was a it was a couple of years away when like the Lemonheads and Buffalo Tom would actually have commercial success. But I think, you know, people, people that were in the know, like at least knew of the A-list of Boston bands. 
Uh, I know. Anyway, I, I did pretty much go for the A-list on that uh, CD. You know, you I did. didn't put on it, on it, you know. Well, you put the Dangerous Birds on it. They're like one of my favorite Boston bands ever that more people know Talia from, you know, Live Skull yeah. and Come than they do about the nature, Dangerous Birds. And you mean, I can't argue with this because you have the Outlets and the Neighborhood, two of my favorite bands, plus La Peste. A La Peste is a band that if people knew more about Wow, they could have been like an enormous band, I thought. Yeah, well, even just think of like the songs that that you just think of as being quintessential Boston songs, even then. I mean, I if you, you don't have to know the rest of La Peste, but Better Off Dead is like yeah. one, one of those songs. You know, it's not perfect that saying, you know, I, I think, you know, I think The Fools should have had a track on it. And, and, you know, It's a Night for Beautiful Girls, I think might have been a good, <laughs> a good choice to put on there. But uh but, you know, I, I had, I think there's 19 tracks on it, which is one more than there is in anything else in that series. 18 is the cutoff. Did you sequence this, sequ do the sequence too? Um, yeah, I think, I think other people at Rhino went, okayed it, but I pretty much did the sequence. It's roughly chronological, not completely chronological. Um, people at Rhino, like, really paid a lot of attention to sequencing. I mean, they, they, uh, they gave thought about what key a song was in. And I don't know anything about that. I pay no attention to that. I just like, I just went from the, the college radio thing. What's going to sound good coming right after this? I did. I sequenced a lot of records when I was at Enigma. That turned into one of my specialties. I would end yeah. up always like we did the Restless Variations compilation. And then later on, and as I even with the charms, when I managed them, I always see I always said, I'm going to do the final sequence. Of course, I wasn't a fascist about it, but, you know, yeah, yeah. I kind of like old school i wanted the best songs up in the top four you know and then after that it was all about the vibe and everything this record is brilliant as far as the sequence goes i mean every there's so many good songs on it i don't even know where to start plus you had the cars demo on here which is fantastic which uh you there's... can actually hear a, a drop off on the tape in that there's a real there's a nice little imperfection because that is the very cartridge that came from the WMBR studio. It, it was the same, it's the same cartridge that was played in 1977, 78 on WMBR. It's the only one we could find. We didn't actually have a connection to the actual cars at that point. I, I'm, I'm you know, my, I've always loved the cars. I saw them yeah. way back in 77 and I'm, I just almost done with Joe Milliken's book, which you're quoted in yeah, on yeah. Ben Orr. And it even gave me a bigger appreciation for the cars. When I heard Ben Orr's story, I had no idea that he was Mr. Cleveland. And when I read the book, I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. I yeah, mean, they were, they were, they were great. And yeah, I, I think everybody had a real emotional connection with the cars. Cause the, uh, you know, the songs that, and, you know, everybody had a crush on somebody that, the soundtrack was a car song. That's just the kind of the kind of songs they wrote. They were just songs that were so relatable and so, and so good. And then you know the Nervous Eaters. You know they were a band that probably should have been bigger. The Loretta, the album that that was on. Uh, you know the name, the Yellow album. Yeah. Um, it was a real disappointment. You know, I mean, well, that that is not the Yellow album version that's on Mass Ave. You know, oh, what, I, I know. What, yeah, what's on Mass Ave is the original single that does not have yes. horns added to it, like the exactly. Album. Yes, um, you exactly. know, I think I think the Nervous Eaters have kind of been dragged through the coals because of that album. Um, you know, it was it, it it was out of nowhere because the entire first side, except for Loretta, was ballads, and they were not at all known for ballads. Um, and I don't think it was strictly a selling out thing. I think like Steve Catato just wanted to show what he could do. And I think he said diversity uh, saw himself more as a songwriter, but they wound up making this record that didn't sound like the nervous eaters, but um, kind of the, I think the kind of other side to that is that Willie Alexander and the boom, boom band made exactly the record they should have made. It was exactly like what they sounded like. It was a great record and that went nowhere either. So some people didn't, you know, some some indirect some like underground punk whatever records just didn't make it no matter how good they were at that yeah time. a lot of those bands had bad luck they never mc uh, uh dmc and the neighborhoods all these bands that got out of the box really hot 
they just didn't translate. It was sad, yeah, we, you know. It, except for the cars in Boston, you know, we didn't have we didn't have a hit for a bunch of years, and then we had quite a few finally. Yeah, the other band I was going to talk about um, was the Atlantics, because Lonely Hearts to me is one of the great songs to come out oh, yeah. of the Boston music scene. Yeah, and, and unfortunately for the Atlantics, they wrote that they you know they're their really deathless song, Lonely Hearts, after they'd already been dropped from a major label. Um, and Bad if you luck. were in Boston, you knew that song. It got played to death on WBCM. Um, so as far as around here go, that song was a hit. But it did not translate nationally, and it really should have. But that was that was a time when there were more local scenes going on. In the You know, the liner notes and the artwork and everything. How did they decide to put the uh, neighborhoods on the cover? Was it did they just like the photograph? I think they just liked the photograph. Um, you know, it looked like a, it looked like you know it looked like a band. It looked like yeah. it looked really rock and roll. And also, the neighborhoods are kind of one of the one of the important bands. So they very were very urban looking photo it. too. You know, yeah. I really it was yeah. it's fantastic. So so. Um, you worked with Todd Rundgren a lot too. You said I was really happy, by the way, that he finally got in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I've been waiting yeah. for that to happen for a long time. Yeah, I didn't work so much with him. I mean, I don't know if he knows me from Adam or anything like that. But um, I've always been a fan, and Rhino happened to have had um, of his catalog at that point. They put out all the CDs of of all his original albums, so so they were doing these compilations. Um, which I got. And with Rhino, there were certain pockets of fandom uh, for certain people. And the whole company was not always into a certain band. I mean, the best example of that is the group that actually made Rhino in terms of putting them over the top with what they were selling was the Monkees, because they, they, they licensed the Monkees catalog just before MTV revived them. So suddenly Rhino was making all kinds of money on the Monkees reissues. And the only two people at Rhino that loved the monkeys were me and a 13, and 13, he was 18, an 18 year old <laughs> kid named, named, named Andrew. And Andrew was uh, the deputy of the remastering guy, Bill England. And Andrew would always, he, he was so interested in the monkeys that he was going into the, going into the files and pulling out obscure tracks that had never been released. And he was making me cassettes of these tracks because he knew I was a fan and we became friends. You know, fast forward, fast forward to 2021, Andrew's the monkey's manager now. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. And, he, and, and he is and he is known as like the world's, he just put out a book. It's a, a massive book on the monkey's history. And he's not only their manager, but kind of the world's foremost authority on the monkeys. One of my so, friends just told me he saw Mickey and uh, uh, Mike, they're the only ones left, at Foxwoods. Yeah, uh, <laughs> oh, I saw, I saw them at uh, uh, Medford, the Chevalier. Oh, really? Probably the night after Foxwoods, I guess it was, yeah. How was it? It was great. Yeah. Yes, it's really good to see that. Yeah, it's the last time we'll ever see those guys. I never got to see yeah. the monkeys, unfortunately. Yeah. So um, I, I found this book, you know, someone gave it to me a long time ago, the Boston Rock Trivia book that you and Clea yeah. Simon did together. Yeah. I've had this book forever because I remember someone gave it to me when it came out. And uh, you could do an updated version of this now, and like you know, yeah. add a we lot. We could, we it. could, because nearly everything in there is way out of date at this point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is fantastic, though. And you've had a bunch of books since then. You've had a pretty good career as an author. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you about that. And there's um, Cleo, Cleo, and I have been friends for, for God, I don't, I don't know. We became friends in the '80s, so. Um, I always uh, imagined that, that you guys went to journalism school together and you're we're in the same journalism class yeah, or something. No, she, yeah. I don't I don't think she went to journalism. She I know she I know she went to Harvard. I don't know, I'm not even sure what she studied. Um, but at that point she had a friend that was connected to this tiny tiny press that put out bought that put out all kinds of trivia books. They did a couple Boston sports trivia. And so this friend said, let's get these two to do Boston music trivia. 
Boston Rock trivia, which we did, we had to go to small claims court to even get paid the 500 bucks each we were supposed to be getting for that book. <laughs> and, then, and, then they, and then they took it out of print and then they went belly up. So they, <laughs> Wow, okay. Yeah. But well, there, it's there, a- there is, my favorite thing in that book, there's a picture of, of me and Clea doing laundry at the, uh, and, <laughs> and it says, what's the significance of this picture? And it's because it's in the laundry room that had been the underground. Wow. The underground, the underground being a club in Alston that maybe some people watching this will remember. Yeah, we're going yeah. way back there. When you that were was going- fall of ni- fall of 1980, closed uh, in spring of 1980. So I can imagine in the 80s when you before you went to Rhino and you were working in Boston, you must have went to a lot of shows back then. Well, considering I lived on Kelton Street in Alston. And considering how long it takes to walk to Bungratties from Kelton Street, maybe seven minutes, um, you know, depending on whether you stopped at, you know, Pizzeria Uno on the way or not. Um, so, yeah. And at that point, um, I'm thinking 88, 89, everybody played at Bungratties the night after they played the Rats. So, yeah, I didn't have to go very far. So and you- also, um Writing for the Globe, I mean, if you if you are a, a terminal music fan like myself, um, when I was writing for the Globe, I was able to get into almost anything I wanted to see. And that was all I wanted in life, really. So uh, so I was not going to waste it. You had a long run with the Boston Phoenix, too. You wrote for them for yeah. years. Yeah, I wrote for them for a number of years. Um, well, the, the trajectory is, you know, I wrote for the Globe until I went to L.A., came back from L.A., wrote for the phoenix during most of the 90s until until they ended you were and you came now I'm writing back. for the now i'm writing for the herald um <laughs> i just uh, this this would have been such a big deal but the story i have coming up in the herald this week i interviewed new edition and the new kids on the block in the same day because they're doing something for the american music awards i heard about Sunday. that wow yeah. was with was everyone there for the interviews? no this was this was but via zoom i talked to uh Mike B- Mike Bivens and Ronnie DeVoe from New Edition, and I talked to Donnie Wahlberg from the New Kids. And it's like, can you imagine how many dates that would have got me in the 80s to have talked to the New Kids? <laughs> <laughs> well, Donnie must have been fun to talk to. He seems like he was, a cool he dude. He's great. He's, he, he's really articulate. He got a really you know, good sense of where he's at. And what, you know, and they completely like, they're having fun with it, with the fact that they were, th- that they were this boy band. And then there's like, it's not anything they have to live down or feel bad about. They're having, they're having a blast. Did Jenny McCarthy sneak onto the Zoom call while you're talking to Donnie? I'm, I'm afraid not. No. <laughs> that would have been fun. Maybe next time. <laughs> well, that's an interesting. I, I got to check that out. I heard that they were doing something together, but I wasn't sure exactly what. It's yeah, like some really- sort of Boston showdown thing they're doing for the American Music Awards. Yeah, even though I'm a more, you know, I'm a big rock guy, I still appreciate the fact that Donna Summer and the New Kids on the Block, yeah. New Edition, all came from the the Boston area. You know, I mean that that's a really important. Those are three really important acts right there. Yeah, right oh, there. that that was one of the fun things I got to when I was writing for the Globe. Basically, I was the yeah, I was the third guy down in the pecking order in terms of covering music. So I got to review everything that nobody else wanted to, which a lot of times was the really exciting stuff. And I, I went to this little block party thing in Roxbury where Maurice Starr, the empresario, was showing up, showing off his brand new act, the new kids on the block who nobody had ever heard of. It was their first gig. And I was there. Wow. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. Um, you wrote a, you wrote, of your, of, you have several books here, but the one yeah. that I was curious to talk to you about was Don't All Thank Me at Once, The Lost Genius of Scott Miller, 2015. Yeah. I, I can't even begin to tell you how many people ask me about game theory. You know, I worked with a million bands when I, you know, not just Enigma, but A&M and all the labels I worked for. But people, a lot of people want to talk about game theory. They're like one of those the lost gene perfect title you know i when i was at enigma 
Scott Vanderbilt came to work at Enigma. He was essentially game theory's manager and the one that brought them to Enigma. So I got to be around Scott a lot. And he told me, talked about UC Davis with me all the time and the great scene up there. How, I didn't realize that you were, I mean, how would I know that whether you're a Scott Miller fan? What, what brought you to the point where you decided it was time someone gave credit to this genius that he never really seemed to get? Yeah, um, I am. I was completely a, con a convert to Scott Miller and Game Theory, and also his next band, the Loud Family, um, because after um, after Game Theory finished with Alien, I uh, finished with with Enigma. I was working after Rhino. I stayed in LA and worked for a label called Alias, um, where I was also uh, doing publicity stuff. But I got to everybody got to elbow a band onto the label. And Scott knew, knew that I liked him because I'd written about game theory some, and he started sending me demos. And these demos were some of the greatest songs I'd ever heard in my life. I mean, God, uh, you know, Jimmy comes around and take me down to hallucination town. And the, 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 the kind of standout songs on the first Loud Family record, he was sending me these cassettes and I just like, my, you know, my eyes were popping out of my head. This was, this, these were the most perfect pop songs I'd ever heard. And um, I, I would still say that Scott's up there are like anybody you want to name. I mean, Alex Chilton, anybody, you know, any, any people that are known for writing great, great melodic pop songs, he, he was as great as any of them. Um, so I got to help shepherd that first Loud Family album through through the process at Alias, and he put my name on the record, which was one of the one of the great honors. Um, Scott was a hard guy to get to know, as you probably found out. He's he was very quiet, very introverted, um, and as it turned out, very depressed. And I'm so you know, it's I'm sorry his story ended as sadly as it did because it should that that should not have happened, um, but. Um, I, I basically, what, what happened was at the urging of a former member of Game Theory, the drummer Gil Ray, um, I proposed um, the album, the Game Theory album, Lolita Nation to the 33 and a third series. And it made the semi-finalists for that series and did not make the, uh, didn't make the final cut because they thought it was too obscure. Somebody, somebody at 33 and a third said they really liked the proposal. And I got urged by some people saying, why don't you go ahead and write this? Um, so that's what I did. It took up a lot of time and it's hard to do when you write, when you write a biography of a person that's no longer with us, you wound up really kind of invading the world of a lot of people that are still with us. And Did, did you, you happen kinda, to talk to Scott Vanderbilt at all? I talked to Scott. Yeah, I, yeah. I talked to, I talked to a lot of people in, in Scott Miller's orbit, you know, um, people he'd had personal relationships with most of his bandmates, um, um, you know, Mitch Easter who produced his yeah. records, um, everybody, I, everybody I could, um, you know, to try and it was, it was a really hard errand to try and get a handle on, on who Scott really was and, you know, how that all translated into the music he made and you know it, it's it was it was a it was a quite it was an undertaking yeah the the real nighttime record to me is one of the great pop you know like indie pop records i guess you would say ever made i mean i thought that record was just brilliant it's 20, 24 and all those tracks were just so oh, good. good yeah and then Lolita Nation, the yeah. uh, the double the double album they made for Enigma, yeah. or, you know, a little later on, that was kind of you know let's put all these incredible pop songs, but let's also like let's also pursue this kind of weird abstract stuff and somehow make it work together with the pop songs. You know, it's it's there are there are no records like that. And people, uh, if people are good. If people are going to hear one record, I'd say the leading nation is the one. But uh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, what are you doing these days, Brad? I mean, did you go? You were down in New Orleans for a while. I understand. Um, I did. I did uh, live in New Orleans for a while, which became. Uh, 
I, I was editing a magazine down there called Offbeat. I did that for a year and I knew that it would be kind of financially unfeasible. Uh, in, other <laughs> words, I, in other words, I lost money, but I say, you know, but I said, hey, I get to live in New Orleans for a year and it'll kind of pay for itself. So let's do that. Um, and, um, but, you know, I still love that city. Um, mm. I, would live, I would live there some more if I could, um, but I go down to visit. I, I was down there two weeks ago, or no, no like four weeks ago now. Um, they, they've, they've still got some incredible music. Um, what I'm doing now is, you know, living the busy freelance life. I mean, I'm still, I got a weekly column in the Herald. The main thing keeping me afloat is Harvard, and that's got nothing to do with music or, or even arts. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a regular writer for Harvard Law today. Um, oh really which, i didn't know yeah. that wow that's cool yeah which requires me to kind of you know get get a working knowledge of some of of some legal stuff just in order to um explain you know what what i basically do is i absorb a lot of a lot of legal you know discussions and and, and symposia and that kind of thing and write about them for a general audience and so that involves a lot of knowing what I'm talking about, but but it's 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 solid stuff that I get to do as a writer, and it's gotten me to be present in things like oh, there was a um, an event at Sanders Theater a couple of years ago where six Supreme Court judges were under the same roof at the same time, and I got to be present at that, which was kind of fun. Wow, that's pretty yeah. cool. It's yeah. pretty. Co I just got a couple more things for you. Um, um, this is a this will be a difficult question for you, but I have to ask you because you're a big Boston rock fan like I am. If you had to pick, I won't say one. If you had to pick like two of your all time favorite records ever to come out of the Boston scene, what what would what would be near the top of that list or at the top of the list? Oh, favorite records. Well, um, have to be have to be something by the Liars because they're probably my all time favorite. The Liars Boston. are. Boston, okay. Boston band. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that on a good night, they just get to the primal core of what rock and roll is all about, I think, as well as any band I've ever seen. Um, my favorite album of theirs is not their most popular record by any means. They did an album called The Promise is a Promise, um, which was a total, uh, it's like their raw power. It's a very, it's a real kind of uh, um raw raw intense kind of punky album with a lot of loud guitar on it i think it's a great great rock and roll record i knew um, you were going to pick a garage rock record i knew yeah that well, the, I well the, the other one i think <laughs> um the other one i think um i think tremendously important record is the first throwing muses album um oh yeah it's, yeah that was you know amazing amazing record very visionary in terms of the way it kind of upended the whole structural thing with songs the way it was like really kind of kind of you did not know what they were talking about but you could feel what they were talking about and everybody on that record was under 20 which which was you know unheard of even here there were there was nobody that good that young just yet um you know even before hardcore or even most of the hardcore bands were over 20 so um Right. So, and I still think Kristen Hurst is one of and, and Tanya her. Donnelly both are are two of the best writer or talented people to ever come out of Boston. Yeah, Hips um, and Makers uh Christian solo records, one of my all-time favorite records. Great record. I mean, I prefer her when she's loud, but uh, but I'll yeah, listen, yeah. I'll listen to I'll listen to the quiet stuff as well. Um and for a Mission of Burma record, I, I wouldn't pick verses, I'd pick their second reunion album, which was the Obliterati. Um, Whoa, that, that's a that, surprise. That's what, listen to it. There's certain songs on that record um, that are the best ones they ever wound up writing. Yeah, I also wanted to ask you about current music. If there's any current bands that are artists that you're listening to, like, do you have Olivia Rodrigo on your turntable? I mean, what, what exactly are you listening to these days? I know you got to be up on new music. Uh, not as not as much as I'd like to be, but I'm kind of I'm following a lot of what comes out on on Rumbar and Red on Red because those two labels tend to put out nothing but records. I wind up enjoying. Oh, so you like the Boston bands? Yeah, yeah, mostly. Yeah, 
That's cool. Wow. Yeah, I like Lou. Lou. Lou was Lou, both of them were on my show. Lou and Justine. So I feel yeah. the same way as you do. Yeah, so, I think the, those those guys are true believers, and I think they're you know, Boston's always depended on people that are willing to kind of lose their shirts putting records. <laughs> I think you and I both have some experience in that. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. I don't know if that's. Oops, sorry about that. Sorry about that. That was my oh, phone. Cool. I should have turned it off. But anyways, that was oh, you in, know. In, ter in terms of in terms of new artists that are not from Boston. Yeah. Um, Big Thief, if if you know them. Big Thief. Yeah, they're kind of like uh, they're 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 kind of like a cross between throwing muses and Crazy Horse. <laughs> like they they ha they have like wow they have this this <laughs> very very interesting very angular songwriter up front and um and yet the band is kind of they have this kind of classic americana garage you know kind of a rough edge guitar thing happening underneath it um you know they're they're not they're not so new anymore but i think probably the best band on the planet is guided by voices you're always you're very eclectic. <laughs> you have a lot of yeah. different tastes. I appreciate that. Hey man, thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to me, man. I really appreciate it, Brett. Always a always a pleasure. All yeah. right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye.